Hey David, I notice you have been having trouble with getting your writing down lately. You're too busy with far more important tasks like ranking baseball players and Pokemon rather than any creative expression. All right, all right, Donald. No need to be so blunt about it. Even though it's true. Why can't you do it then? Why can't you just sit down, crack your knuckles, churn your creative juices, and type some stuff on your laptop? I don't know, but it's really bothering me. I guess it's some sort of hesitancy I have about being creative. Like, I can't get into the mindset of an artist anymore. I'm too focused on whether or not writing will be meaningful toward getting a job or progressing further in life. So you rank baseball players in Pokemon because it's more meaningful? Yes! Yes it is, damn it! There's more content there! Uh, okay, if you say so. It is! Oh uh, boy, so much negativity. Your soul is in a dark place. But I know exactly what to do. I've been doing this a ton lately. It's really been beneficial to expanding my creative energies. What do you mean, expanding creative energies? I don't need that. You'll see, don't worry. Here, take this floor mat, place the scented candle down over there, put on this exercise shirt and spandex briefs. Ugh, these are so tight. I can feel the spandex clinging to my nether regions like an iron plunger. And let me just turn on the music. Welcome, David, to Writer's Yoga. Oh, God. Breathe in. Clear your mind. Focus on the feelings that keep you from writing and flush them out. Flush them out? With what? My mind toilet? Breathe in the soothing energies of the universe. Soften your nerves and anxieties. Breathe out the pressure of your inner darkness. This isn't helping, Donald. Because you're not letting it, David. You have to loosen your muscles. Let me guess. Creative muscles? Well, when you loosen your physicality, you enhance your mentality and replenish your creativity. Here, stretch your arms high in the air. Now lower them to the ground. Mm, sure, I can definitely do that so far. These stiff back muscles of mine can contort like mad. Well then, let me assist you. Whoa, whoa, what are you doing with your hands there, Donald? Helping you contort. Let me push down on your back. Ah! <laughs> your physicality loosens. Your hands now graze upon the ground. Oh, oh boy. Oh, boy. Breathe in, David. <laughs> Feel the anxieties of writing hesitancy wash away. <laughs> now breathe out. <sighs> okay. Okay. This isn't so bad. Now, you must reach deep into your mind and pull out the darkness. I shall push you further. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Move your shoulders between your thighs. Ah! Reach your hands upon your back. Oh, God, oh, God, it hurts! Your arms are curved along your spine. Your face is now upon your ass. Oh, God almighty, it hurts! <laughs> Breathe in. Reach for the darkness that keeps you from writing. Breathe out. Release the shadowed energies. And now you can reach back. Return your shoulders from out of your thighs. Remove your face from your rump. Restraighten your spine. Release the malevolent forces. Oh, I'm straightened! I'm standing! I'm standing, okay? Breathe in. And breathe out. And that, David, is writer's yoga. Wow. You're right, Donald. I feel so free of the darkness. My creative energies have been rejuvenated. Glad I could help, David. See, isn't it great? The temple of my physicality has been cleansed. My pool of inspiration has been replenished. All right, get over yourself. Now go right already. I shall, Donald. But, but 
Wait, wait, I think I missed a season of the St. Louis Cardinals players. And now that I think about it, I haven't mapped up the stats of Squirtle against monsters of every element type. No, no, don't. You're falling back into your old ways. To the computer! I need to write down all of these figures now! No, no! The temple of your physicality must be cleansed further. We must do another round of writer's yoga. Here, let us perform the poetic pretzel. Poetic pretzel? <laughs> Welcome, fellow nerds, to another episode of The Ritwit, the show where the hosts constantly offend the titans of English literature past by saying that we don't care about reading deeper into any works besides our own. It's like, you know, that, that classic uh, meme that I've seen shared that English teachers hate, where it's like, the curtains are blue, is what the book says. And the English teacher says, now what this means is that it represents the, the depression <laughs> of the uh, character and subsequently a depression of the author and uses mm -hmm. to sort of relay that theme. Mm -hmm. And then what the author meant was the curtains are f***ing blue. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to red, which is pretty typical. Uh, it, well, and, you know, we, we tend to be highly critical of things because we can but i know donald in particular he doesn't really give much wit to, to, to give much care for william shakespeare look i understand <laughs> how important he was uh to english language as a that whole is, yeah and to literature and storytelling yeah. i get it but that's just understanding the history of it that's like, not caring about what he put out yeah i'm not <laughs> i mean if someone says hey do you want to go see uh the theater perform 12th night I'm like, if it doesn't have Amanda Bynes, it isn't set in high school. It's not. I'm not interested. <laughs> nah, I'll probably. I still thought that see was it. Midsummer Night's Dream. That no, was that was Twelfth oh, Night. Okay, she's the man with Twelfth okay. Night. All right. Um, ten things I hate about you was Taming of the Shrew. Yeah, no, I I know that one. Hey, that that trend of doing old stories with in set in a high modern high school that started with your favorite movie clueless my favorite that yes. was emma it's even more it's even more my favorite than avatar let me tell you <laughs> which do you like better clueless or avatar mm, i sat through I mean, again, far more of avatar but i still didn't saw, care you saw 10 minutes of clueless <laughs> said nope i'm done <laughs> you saw <laughs> Let's see. An I hour saw like an 40. hour and a half or something of Avatar, and it's just like, there's a second part? No, put it away. Pick one. <laughs> you got a gun in your head. I'll watch Avatar. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Of the two. Anyway, <laughs> <All right. laughs> we're back, listeners, with the second episode in our set about serialized works you can see from the title, but we're not getting there until we do vocab vitamin of the month. Yes. Which this month is the word quixotic. Ooh, nice word. Q-U-I-X-O-T-I-C. The mm -hmm. simple definition, overly unrealistic. It's simply quixotic of me to think that we'll ever get real fans of this show. <laughs> All you are sentence. fake fans. <laughs> a sample sentence. My quixotic plan was to rent a villa in Hawaii. And then I looked at the price. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to being a millennial. <laughs> now go ahead and take your vitamin, listeners. Until next set, if you'd like to share excerpts of you using the vocab vitamins and would like us to share those on the air please let us know yes. we'll tell you how to contact us at the end of the episode all you real fans please let us know i would be actually be interested to see how they'd use this word so compared to effervescence or <laughs> or, or any of the others we've used bifurcation or what no, no, no they're just specifically time. doing the two that i've you done so effervescence, effervescence and defenestrate and, and def <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right uh how about shellacking that's a fun one anyway that is a fun one i forgot <clears throat> we did that one i mean i have a list so i don't repeat words <laughs> anyway when are we gonna do brobdignagian <laughs> <laughs> well no we, we don't know if we're gonna do it so <laughs> <laughs> the tim allen not foghorn but <laughs> <laughs> it is so very, very much Tim Allen's foghorn. Anyway, well, <clears throat> all right. So all right, anyways, we're, I feel we're like talking this, about. I feel like this topic requires a bit of setup. So while it yes, might be a strange, we're, we're in the middle of our set about uh, the pitfalls of writing serial works. Mm -hmm. So what are we talking about this week? So here we go. It may be a strange metaphor, but a good story probably works like one's checking account. You need to fill it up so it's functional. Mm -hmm. You will need to pay for things by taking out some of that accumulation. Yes. How does this relate to our set this time? Well, some writers strive to keep adding things in their sprawling sagas. And unfortunately... I like how you're using your hands here. Like, boop, 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 boop. Well, I'm, I'm more sh pushing them out from me. But anyway, uh, unfortunately, not all of those things have enough balance in the 
account to pay right. We overdraft, get a silly fee for being bad with our money. The strongest writers avoid adding unnecessary... I totally worded that backwards. The strongest you got lost writers in your- avoid adding unnecessary subplots that won't receive at least some kind of payoff on the road. You got so lost in your metaphor that, that I you- started mixing up my words. Yeah, yeah, so... It's great. Anyway, so yeah, I mean, it, it's... You have to you have to wi- deposit money into your account to make it work, but on the other end, it's expected that you will make withdrawals. Yes, right. So, so how does this relate to writing again? I'm just thinking about how poor I am right now. <laughs> While there is a need, uh, well, I mean, if you look at writing, yes, as an endeavor, I, of, I'd say we, are, we do look at writing on this show. We we do we do a lot of looking <laughs> at writing. Uh, if you look at writing as an endeavor that needs to be paid in, paid out, it works like a checking account. If mm-hmm. you don't have the money in there, you can't pay from the account, right? Mm-hmm. But also, some people like with depositing, okay. depositing. You're and talking just about saving money. All the time. Talk about the s- stories. How does this work in a story? So they deposit writing. this idea, and they deposit another idea, and but they never end up withdrawing anything at the end. And so you're just talking off. about building up and no payoff, basically. Oh, then just say that. All right, now nah, you. While right. there is a need to build up, <laughs> why do writers fall into the trap of building too much without making those withdrawals, rewarding all the things added? I love assuming that I'm building up to the biggest, best, and coolest thing ever. This final battle is going to be a billion pages long, and the action will be explosive, and the villain will dominate overall. It'll be the most awesome finale ever. But I thought evil never wins. What the heck? The villain's dominating over everything. What well, the heck? Well, they're going to dominate all ever, ever, all until the last second where the hero. Oh, the last second turnaround. They Got they it. steal themselves. They build up their resolve, and then they stop the bad guy. And then the writer found out they didn't put enough in their bank account to pay, to pay off that part You're of the really story. proud of this <laughs> metaphor, so... What can I say? Uh, okay. I thought it was clever. Well, that's all right. <laughs> uh, but anyways, I, I, I planned this big finale, and then it it's not a great finale because I'm not as skilled of a writer as I thought I was when planning it. <laughs> so... <laughs> But I can be with practice, and you can be too, listeners. So I'd say don't be afraid to build up to big things. Just learn how to successfully pay them off, and you'll be set easy peasy. Or at least after thousands of hours of writing experience, it's then easy peasy. And even then, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, as we, as I frequently say, it, there's no substitute for experience. No, you know, there isn't. You have, to, you have to put yourself through the process of writing. You have to put yourself through the planning process of, okay, I want these plot. This is my main plot, and I need to pay it off this way. It's going to resolve here. I'm going to put things into my bank account these with those little deposits of subplots, but those also need to pay off. Right. One phrase that describes this trap best. Yes. Delusions of grandeur. Oh boy, howdy do I have that. <laughs> I don't know about all of our listeners, but I tend to have ostentatious plans at first and gradually whittle them down. <laughs> if I'm not finished with that phase by the time I start drafting, I'll add some things that don't pay off since it wasn't really important to my plot skeleton. Uh, yes. They'll just be there in the story with no payoff whatsoever. It's like, what, what did this all mean? The other problem I run into, which follows this, I tend to write some stuff spur of the moment, but then walking between sessions so long, I forget what it meant. Either means I don't fulfill the promise inherent, or the execution changes such that I inherently put it in. That's one of the reasons why I try to write every day. I go to my favorite place to write, the coffee shop that shall not be named for For comedic comedic reasons. reasons. (laughs) And Well, I mean, my my thing is, uh, I'll give an example here. Mm Mm-hmm. In Fair on Storm, which I've talked about quite a lot because it's probably the first serious work that I made progress on. And yes. aside from thanks to a co author, Starburst, the furthest I've ever gotten in any of my fix. Cool. Is I had a plan to make one character have some kind of like extrasensory kind of thing, yes. some kind of power. When I got to writing, I had in mind who it was going to be, but then I started writing and I changed it. Oh. Yeah. So. The first couple of episodes are addressing the characters, but not all at once. I didn't want to dump them all in. So the first episode, I focused on two characters. Then the second episode, I focused on two characters. And the third episode was the one left over. 
And so I'm like, well, the one kind of needs something else, and so that's when I made the switch. Right, and then that probably flew, threw some things off. So uh, Only a little bit. Like, it doesn't matter who has it, so long as I'm being consistent with that. And now it's not ki- not really paying off, per se, but he's actually using this thing that he has now. So Well, yay. At least yeah. he made use of it. So. Exactly. I paid it off somewhat. Good job. You did the bare minimum. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, I definitely suffer from delusions of grandeur. How can a writer tell when enough is enough? Adding subplot material. Uh, If the subplot doesn't connect to the narrative in some way or doesn't provide character growth like we discussed last episode, uh, then it probably needs to be cut. It doesn't matter how entertaining it is. If it doesn't bring any of those things, can it? Right. Of course, it's probably not so cut and dry, and you can probably find ways to make it work even without those two things. Well, and something that we didn't mention about serialized works on TV is how many different writers are in the room. Mm-hmm. You know, something well, I bring to the table, I wish I could do that, but if I don't have enough episodes, if I don't get another chance to write the characters at all, Donald may take it up and run with it. He may not. He may take it in a completely different direction. He may never address it ever again. This was the fundamental shortcoming of the Star Wars sequel trilogy. (laughs) No plan. They kept going back and forth. Abrams and Johnson. Well, and, you know, eventually enough is enough they put out a product. And such is the same here. Like, when you're dealing with when you're dealing with production team mandates, you have deadlines and stuff that hopefully in your own writing you don't experience these things because it's a whole lot easier when you're the one solely in control of your story. Yes. More but also st- that you remember what you intended to do. If it go a couple of months before you come back to an episode of Fair on Storm, pointing at myself here, <laughs> that, like, why the heck did I leave that thing in there? It was obviously supposed to lead up to something, but I don't remember what it was. <laughs> uh, that's the thing. You, when you do not have, when you're little enough that you don't have the pressure of, like, a, of a publisher or something breathing down your neck to get done by this time, you do care more because it's more what you're writing but but that also means you can take longer and if you don't have the consistency of writing habits yeah exactly you can take longer it, it's its own worst trap it's self-fulfilling almost prophecy like a, it's almost like a catch-22 it is kind of <laughs> anyways but uh, I mean in those instances hopefully you're smart enough to find a way to edit things or maybe you come up with a different idea that works better than the one you had because if you don't have an idea that sticks Theoretically, there's a better one out there. Right, but look at your story as a whole. Look at each subplot as like a part of this story as a mm-hmm. whole and think to yourself, does it really add anything of value? It can be difficult, but if it's important, throw it in the bloody bin, mate. <laughs> if it's not important, throw it in the bloody bin. No, if it's important. No, if it's I, not, I think you forgot that I forgot that word. not. <laughs> if it's not important, throw it in the bloody bin, mate. <laughs> I suppose it's best stated that the writer doesn't know or else they would likely keep adding Mm -hmm. we're biased for our story so being told no more right is a huge ego check i know i know when you told me when i came to you with like my brilliant idea for wildlife three tomorrow three we got it that was the biggest argument we've ever had i think in 20 years (laughs) i don't know if it was that big i think i agreed with you pretty quickly (laughs) but it was certainly the most uh Demonstrative, like I was getting red right in the face, saying, "This is a stupid idea. Don't do it." Anyway, and I didn't do it. You're, you didn't. You're welcome. I had a great idea. No, it wasn't that great. Thank you. I don't know. <laughs> that's a weird. That's a weird usage. Anyway, uh, that that said, you know, having our first line of defense, reviewers say this isn't worth keeping. Yes, it's helpful feedback, so we don't waste ink over things that don't need to stick in the final manuscript. Right. Exactly. Personally, when I've reached a supposed saturation point, whenever I do feel like enough is enough, I mean, I know exactly what longer pl- longer term plot threads I want. I try not going gonzo and <laughs> adding more unless they can be turned around in the short term. Right, exactly. Done in one isn't a problem, particularly if you have the space, which is up to you, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, hopefully. Talked, Again, I mean, last time, how, last yeah. time we talked about filler a bit because you know if you're given twenty episodes, but your story was based on around ten. Right. Now you have space. Go ahead. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right, but yeah, you, you know, you'd have to hope that 
you don't have an executive bringing down your neck, but that's not true for all of us. No. But if it's true for, if you're big enough to have such an executive, why the hell are you listening to this? <laughs> you should probably make your own podcast about ridding. It might be better. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anyways. So the other, the other thing about building up and not paying off is particularly when you have like this concept that keeps growing in the background and then you get to the point where it's supposed to be paid off and then it's like kind of eh, not right. great pathetic if you have a huge threat that the whole story is building up to obviously you need to build it up a ton of thing that goes without saying right but how can you make sure the payoff is enough to justify all your buildup when this threat comes, make sure you know right away that it means business and isn't messing around anymore. Like, this story's getting real serious here. Yeah. Like, when Voldemort finally came into power in Harry Potter, he took over the school and forced the main three to skip their last year, therefore breaking the usual story conventions. Mm -hmm. uh, when Thanos arrived in, in Infinity War, again, another Marvel thing, <laughs> um, he beat down Asgardians, including previous Avengers villain Loki, and turned the Hulk into paste. Yeah. <laughs> and he kept that level sustained going forward throughout the entire movie. He was always a big threat, yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, he, you, it's good to make it personal uh, in some way, even alongside the usual wipe out the universe shtick of villains. Like, if they have some sort of involvement in a main character's past or some or their backstory or something about them, maybe maybe even events from previous books, Yeah, um, they it makes the readers much more invested. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know for my Megazoic books, buy on Amazon.com, I had the main villain be a part of the, my main character Cortan's identity and impetus for where he, for where he was, mm. and without the villain even realizing it, honestly, at first. But eventually, as the story goes on, the, the villain, who I won't spoil here, yeah. uh, knows Cortan very well, and by the final book, the two consider each other their arch nemeses. <laughs> That's a pretty big upgrade for the one and a pretty low fall for the other. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> I mean, you know, the ripple in a pool argument, you drop a stone. Mm -hmm. There are some things that characters will do that they don't even realize could impact other people. Um, what is the example I want to use here was one of my teachers, you know, mm -hmm. in high school. I really liked what they did and they inspired me to go on to study music they don't know this. They don't know that they were one of my favorite teachers. And look where you are. You ins you are doing a podcast about writing and... And talk about all the music stuff that I do when we talk about what we yeah. write. But anyway. They, I, they must be so proud. <laughs> but I mean, it's one of those things that sometimes it only goes one way, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I know who inspired me. He doesn't necessarily realize that he did that. Right, exactly. I was also going to say there was one time... Uh, I, I'm kind of nervous about putting out this idea on the Ritwit, honestly, because there's a chance that somebody takes it and uses it before I get the chance All to. All right. But, you elaborate. But here we go. I was thinking it within a, uh, obviously, because it's me, it would probably be Power Rangers, but okay, throw it out that a villain uses their strongest attack the very first time they fight the, the fledgling team of Rangers who don't know what the heck they're doing. But they survive. Uh oh. And they train. The next time this guy comes out, uses his strongest attack again. And he's still beaten back. But they get up. And they train. And the villain's attack power never increases, but the, their tolerance to it, their ability to handle it and fight back, keeps growing. Hmm. So his threat level doesn't change. That's kind of like... The as a function of the villain itself, it changes because the team is getting stronger. But isn't that more the opposite of where you want to go as a narrative? Like, you want to get there eventually, but wouldn't it make more sense for him to open up with a slightly weaker attack? Depends. It depends on what level villain this is. I'm not calling this the final villain. Yeah. I'm thinking that this is like one of those general types, the one who leads the troops into battle, but they're still at the mercy of somebody else. Right. Well, that could work. Sure. So that was my... That was my thought. Yeah. Somebody steals it, and I'm going to be mad, but I can't really control that. So <laughs> that's, that's the price you pay for putting your work out there and talking about your work on podcasts. <laughs> now, by the way, as far as I'm concerned, uh, one how, how do you make sure the payoff is enough? Not tipping your hand mm -hmm. too early. 
While I think Thanos, one of the most powerful villains in the Marvel catalog, was a good final boss for the overreaching first saga of the MCU, I hated that they revealed him so soon and did next to nothing with him until the time was ripe. Right. But it's worth mentioning that by teasing him and letting it percolate... Great word. Finally watching him take the field was intimidating. It was. Again, it showed that this means business, you know? There needs to be enough foreshadowing, of course. There should be an appropriate amount of time to fear slash anticipate the happening, whatever that is. And the finally, happening is a terrible movie. So. I'm not saying the movie. I'm just saying, like, the event. <laughs> no, I know. And finally, letting them play no holds barred in the sandbox. <laughs> that recipe will enable your final outcome to feel earned. I remember one way that subtly built up just how powerful Thanos was was in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 uh, when, at the end, after they've killed uh, Ego, spoiler alert, um, you know, who's a celestial, uh, Gamora and Nebula talk, and then Nebula says she's going to help by killing Thanos, and then Gamora says, I don't know if that's possible. They just killed a celestial. How powerful is Thanos if they, she doesn't think killing him is possible? When they just kill the Celestial. So, who well, proclaims depends, himself a god? So. Well, it depends on who's helping them. If it's just the two, yeah, be really hard-pressed. Because they didn't work, they didn't team up against Ego and caught, that was it. You know, they had the rest of the Guardians there. For what it's worth, uh, Thanos did say that when Infinity War, that she, she snuck aboard to kill me, she very nearly succeeded. So, whatever she tried, and there was four years between that and... Guardians of the Galaxy 2, because that came out only... That was took place only a few months after the first one. Mm. So, so anyways. Now, we talked about, you know, making sure the payoff feels right, but are there times when you where you have the inverse problem, where you have too little buildup for a big incident? Or can you make that work? You can make it work, but it has to be under special circumstances. Like, obviously, if you have a giant battle, you should build up to it for the most part. Hmm. But if the story starts with it, <laughs> that can work. But granted, <laughs> granted, that works best in either flashbacks or sequels where you can get to the action right away. I was going to say, there's no way this is book one unless you're being really ambitious. <laughs> like, since the readers know the characters already, that'd be, that'd be a way to do it. But otherwise, that's a good way to circumvent the usual buildup required for a big battle. True. Also, you can have no build-up for a big incident to be used for shock value. The question is, if you have a big battle opening the salvo, mm -hmm. do you still have to get bigger? In a lot of cases you do, then how do you top it? But that's a different problem, I suppose, than this question. Well, you know, uh, a good example of that is um, uh, the, the last of the Star Wars prequels, Revenge of the Sith. That opens up with an enormous battle, the, the biggest space battle in the entire series. Uh, Shows how much I remember it. <laughs> it opens above Coruscant, like right above Coruscant. Okay, yeah. And they're rescuing the Chancellor or whatever. Mm. So uh, that that whole movie, it opens up with that. So naturally, it can't follow that with an even bigger space battle, and it doesn't. It follows it with a really big personal battle. Yeah, so, fair enough. Um, but like, also, you can have uh, no buildup for a big incident to be used for shock value. Mm -hmm. Like Aquaman has roughly seventeen <laughs> scenes, <laughs> maybe <laughs> over, maybe a bit exaggerated, but where not much. a big explosion interrupts characters and gives them right into the thick of an action sequence. But it doesn't necessarily all, always have to be about action. Like in the animated Mulan from Disney, uh, there is a lighthearted romp of a song called "A Girl Worth Fighting For." That the a girl worth fighting. Yep, exactly. The soldiers sing merrily as they march, only for it to stop mid-lyric, as you demonstrated. <laughs> as they see the wreckage of a village the Huns have raised. It's super sudden and jarring, but it's totally on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> and it's incredibly effective for it. Mm -hmm. Of course, the live-action version ruined it by just having them come across the ruins. Because why do a good thing when you could do a worse thing? <laughs> Makes perfect sense to me. Ugh. Mm. I appreciate some of the casting choices, at least, in the live-action Milan, I think, but, like, that, to me, felt like they really didn't need it. They just did it. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, that's, that's, they do all of them for the money. The only ones that could actually be interesting are ones that, like, they could improve upon. It, well, how would you do beauty? I, I didn't see the one with Emma Watson. I should because I. You talk about like how much Emma you Watson. love it because as Emma Watson, you haven't even seen it. Yeah, no. I But I, I'm interested to see... 
I mean, I'm sure it's probably CGI, but like all of the candelabras yeah, and clocks. Yeah, it is and CGI, everything. and it looks really weird. There's no way they can do that in live action the same way they do it in animated. But anyway. Uh, um, the, I'm just waiting for them to do a live action Atlantis Lost Empire. Oh, God. <laughs> but they're not going to because that one initially bombed. Even though it's a cult classic now, Disney's all about them sweet, sweet moolah. Mm. And that's not a guaranteed success, even though nothing's extra, a guaranteed success. sweet dollars. Um, I was, I was going to say that reminded me. Uh, this, this may be a sneak peek if some of you end up ever listening to the podcast I'm working on called Nerds Are Us. But we do a thing called brand boosting, and we make our own, like, fake hashtags watching shows yeah and i'm just thinking atlantis the lost empire because a lot of it takes place underwater there was a phenomenon in toku shows in the 70s and 80s because they didn't have fancy special effects that they'd have people fighting i'll use air quotes underwater and so i'll use the hashtag apply the bubble screen Ah, so they the put bubble like this, screen. They say so they put this thing. They put this thing that's showing bubbles in front of where they're actually like fighting on dry land. Obviously, and it's just hilarious. Well, that's one way to do it. I know for <laughs> the Aquaman movie again, bringing that up again. They uh, of course filmed all, a lot of the underwater scenes up above water and just CGI'd their hair to look. Well, I mean, you got to keep the actors safe, and it's far easier to keep them safe if you're not asking them to hold their breath. And also if they're talking <laughs> underwater, you know. <laughs> Anyways, what about you? Uh, it's a problem to have no buildup for a big thing when there's too much unknown. Mm -hmm. Like Donald said, unless you start flashback and build back to the present all of the new characters dynamics diplomacy stuff that goes into a fight of such magnitude assuming it is a fight <laughs> has no reference for the new audience right but if it's the third book already sure why not you're probably foreshadowing stuff for that in the previous two installments I hope. You'd Such like to that hope. it's not an issue. <laughs> You'd like to hope. I mean, if you end book two saying, we're going to war, guys, and then you open book three with the war itself, I mean, that's I was going to say, obvious. we're going to war, beginning of book three. That was a great war. <laughs> I wish you all could have seen we won. it. I'm glad we won. Yeah, no, anyway. I, I'd, <laughs> honestly, I'd honestly be more worried about the inverse of this question, which is too much buildup and the payoff is underwhelming. Well, that's whatever the circumstance. That's what the episode's about. That's why I wanted to briefly talk about the inverse. But the, the this, that, yeah, the, what but you're the talking about. The main pitfall there. there. That's what the whole episode's about. So that's, yeah. yeah. But that's, as I said, I'd be far more worried about that. Well, speaking of uh, in doing a big thing without any buildup, that's it for this week. <laughs> <laughs> We're all built up and no payoff here, yeah. <laughs> well, a huge thank you to our patrons so far. Absolutely. If you'd like to if you'd like to look into that, please check out patreon.com slash Matthew Donald. That supports both this podcast and his other podcast, Paleo Bites. Yes. Please do take a listen to that if some you're not. Some bonus content, mostly Paleo Bites, but there's some Ritwit stuff. I mean, there's a lot more you can do with bonus content for a show like Paleo Bites where it's about animals and animals are in just about any form of media so <laughs> well that is what i do i discuss pop culture featuring different prehistoric animals and lately i've gotten a lot looser <laughs> yeah but the definition of prehistoric animals <laughs> uh let's see i don't think it's no it's definitely not out by the time this episode comes out but i've got a godzilla versus kong one coming out <laughs> uh just because he wanted to talk about it, let's be real. But yes. anyway, yeah, your support there means a lot to us mm -hmm. and allows us to continue making content like this, including some exclusive stuff that you are you can sign up for there. More information, as always, yes. available on the site. Check the description. If you want to get in touch with us, mm -hmm. share those excerpts of like vocab vitamins in use in your own works. And I want to hear you guys, you how you guys use quixotic. So. Or uh, defenestrate. <laughs> I really want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's just as simple as using your own email system or going to the Matthew Donald Creator webpage and using the email address mattd at matthewdonaldcreator.com. Yes. If you have general questions, episode suggestions, comments you'd like us to share, let us know. If you're going to talk to one of us, please specify David or Donald, right, please. Right, exactly. And 
We'll read your comments on reading the fan mail if you want to. Yeah, if you want us to share, we're happy to do that. We've done it before, sometimes more often than others. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to follow me personally, you can follow me at Matthew Don Creator on Facebook, at Matthew Don 64 on Twitter, and Matthew Don 64 on Instagram. Why 64? Because that's my shoe size, of course. I'm a freaking kangaroo. Boing, think, boing, boing, boing. I don't think boing, kangaroos boing. get up to 64, but I'm not entirely sure how they'd measure that at that point. You do in like, what? Centimeters, as in the European system, I guess. I don't know. I know Michael Jordan's <laughs> a size twenty-two. Yeah, but that's an American shoe sizes. So, so European uh, from Japan, they actually measured feet in centimeters, and that's how they sold all their shoes. Mm-hmm. So I actually had to look up a guide that was like a converter for U.S. shoe size to centimeters, so I could know what ski boots to wear, so I could know what ice skates to wear. Two things that I got See, the privilege as of doing a size while I was over there. as a size sixty-four shoe size. I don't need ski boots. I just use my feet as skis. <laughs> <laughs> if you run across an ice patch, that's really going to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what they say about big feet. No, I'm just <laughs> big dams. Oh, that's a different joke. Yeah, it was uh, a, another <laughs> ep- another show, yeah. From from Paleo Bites. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we've tweeted ourselves out about one particular pitfall of writing serial works. We'll be back next week with a different one. Yes. Until then, keep writing the good right. I'm Matt Donald. I'm Matt David. Yeah, Stay and- safe. Wash your hands. If you haven't got a vaccine and you're choosing to do so, please. Seriously, at can. this point, get your damn vaccine. Anyways. All right. Bye. We'll see you next time. Bye. The Red Poetic pretzel. Ah! Ah! Ah!